For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kim Portmas, and I am a proud member of the IAI STEP team based in Panama. Um, warm welcome to all of you today. We're very excited to have our fellows present from our current cohort and our new fellows that are joining this coming year as well. Some strategic partners from our community of STEP. Thank you to everyone for coming today. Just quickly, some housekeeping. We are a bilingual organization, and we're very happy to say that we have simultaneous interpretation available today. So all you have to do is to click the little globe in the corner of your Zoom, at the bottom of your Zoom, to select the language of your preference today. Thank you so much to our interpreters today for helping us out. We would also like to encourage everyone to write their full name in their window, and if possible, your institutional affiliation. That will help us get to know you and make a personal connection. Um, please remember to turn your microphones off while we are making our presentations. And we will also be using this morning or throughout our presentation, another engagement tool because we want to hear from you. So please, if you have any questions or comments, you can use the chat box in Zoom, but we will also be using this tool, which is called Slido. So since I know that all of you have your smartphones in hand, you can go ahead and scan this QR code right now, which will take you to a platform where we will have some live polling questions throughout the presentation today, as well as some Q&A, which will enable us to have a dialogue with you throughout the presentations this morning. So we're gonna give it a go. And Anna, if you're there, perhaps this is the part I might not need you just yet. So chime in. Um, this is the first question we have for us today. What is science diplomacy? We have such a broad audience present today. And science diplomacy is a trending topic. And we are curious to know from each of you what you consider to be the definition of science diplomacy. So go ahead and access this in the Slido app. If you're unable to do that, go ahead and write it in the chat and we will put it in as we go. Um, but we will share at the end a pretty cool word cloud on what the definitions of science diplomacy are for all of us present today. So as you're doing that, I'm gonna go over the agenda quickly, what we can expect for this forum today. We will have some welcome and introductory remarks by our team from the IAI directorate, followed by some words from our intrepid science diplomacy trainer, Dr. Marga Gualsoler. We want to open it up for discussions after that to make sure that any, anyone who has questions or comments has time to do so before we launch into the bulk of the forum today, which is our fellows. We're very excited to hear from each of them as they present the results and some of their recommendations from their science diplomacy projects for the remainder of the session. So with that agenda, I'm going to kick it off. I'm gonna stop sharing actually, so I can see everyone's faces. Hi. <laughs> and if Marcos is here, invite him to the stage. Marcos, Marcela, is he here? Um, I haven't seen him. Maybe he had a problem. Uh, okay. If not, I'll I'll just go ahead, Kim. So up Sounds to you. Sounds <laughs> good. Absolutely. Okay, Marcela, our deputy executive director and director of capacity building for the IEI, will go ahead and do the welcome and introductory remarks today. Thank you, Marcela, for filling in. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, for the kind introduction. Welcome to everybody. And uh, this is going to be switching from English to Spanish. Luckily, we have simultaneous translation um, just in respect to all our member countries and fellows and host organizations, uh, which are and who are Spanish and English speakers and Portuguese speakers as well. Some Canadians, also French speakers. 
so we'll try to be um, multinational and also speaking in several languages. So on behalf of the IEI, uh, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, we'd like to give all of you a warm welcome to this forum, the STEP uh, program forum. A uh, special welcome to our fellows uh, who have been working with us for this past year from four regional countries, Argentina, Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And also we're gonna give a very warm welcome to the new fellows who are joining us. And then I'll switch a little bit to Spanish. Um, estamos muy contentos de tener el evento el día de hoy no solamente para mostrar un poquito el trabajo del programa STEP en este último año, juntamente con todos los fellows, las instituciones anfitrionas, pero también mencionar algunos socios estratégicos con quien hemos trabajado este último año. Quisiera nombrar CREA, la, el Consorcio Regional de Experimentación Agrícola de Argentina, con nuestros fellows CREA, con ICET, STEP de Argentina, eh, la CETE, la Secretaría de Educación, Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación del Gobierno de la Ciudad de México, con nuestros fellows uh, CETE, eh, STEP de México, también nuestros socios estratégicos, AAAS, eh, la Asociación Estadounidense para el Avance de la Ciencia, con nuestros fellows AAAS, y STEP que participan en la capacitación de diplomacia científica y también de Canadá, MyTech con nuestros fellows MyTech STEP que también han participado de este programa intenso del último año con todos los demás fellows de Norteamérica y Latinoamérica. Eh, nos gustaría también dar las más cordiales bienvenidas a los fellows que empiezan la segunda generación de STEP sus organizaciones anfitrionas y países participantes que entran en el programa. Empiezo con los fellows de Brasil, eh, del Ministerio de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación, los fellows de la Plataforma Brasilera o Brasileña para Biodiversidad y Servicios Ecosistémicos, los fellows del Caribe, del Centro de Gestión de Recursos y Estudios Ambientales en la Universidad de West Indies, en partnership con NOAA de los Estados Unidos. Bienvenidos también a los fellows de Panamá, de la Secretaría Nacional de Ciencia, Tecnología e Innovación. Y también nuevos fellows de AAAS de los Estados Unidos. Y ojalá también estaremos incorporando a nuevos fellows de MyTechs de Canadá. Eh, para nosotros en el IAI, en el programa STEP, es una gran alegría y un gran logro poder expandir el programa STEP con un poco más de un año eh, para otros países del continente, especialmente para América Latina y el Caribe, un programa estratégico y innovador para formar capacidades en asesoría científica y futuros líderes de nuestros países que van a poder compartir su conocimiento, su experiencia y su liderazgo en la interfaz entre los procesos del conocimiento científico y el apoyo a todo el proceso de toma de decisiones de los gobiernos, pero también del sector privado. Es, es un gran desafío, pero también es una gran oportunidad en estos tiempos de cambios ambientales globales, que son grandes desafíos para los gobiernos y para toda la humanidad y la sociedad. Y realmente creemos fuertemente que un programa como este puede compartir eh, facilitando el conocimiento científico y políticas basadas en la evidencia. Eh, no es un, somos muy ambiciosos, no es un trabajo muy sencillo, pero tenemos mucha confianza uh -huh. de que hay cada vez más, más interés en la comunicación de la ciencia para las políticas, la capacitación de los fellows que realmente tienen y traen una experticia muy importante y también tiene muchas ganas y voluntad de poder facilitar este conocimiento para apoyar estos procesos de decisión tan deseados y tan necesarios. Y por último, para los participantes que no conocen mucho el trabajo del IAI, quisiera informarles que el IAI es un organismo intergubernamental 
fuimos establecidos y trabajamos con 19 países del continente americano en temas de cambio ambiental global. El próximo año, eh, 2022, en mayo, nosotros cumplimos 30 años, tenemos nuestro aniversario y va a ser un año muy, muy especial y esperemos poder organizar muchos eventos de, para mostrar el trabajo que hemos desarrollado en ciencia, investigación, en capacitación, en interfaz de comunicación de la ciencia para las políticas, eh, trabajando con tomadores de decisiones y también con científicos. Y en este sentido, el programa STEP es único porque abarca e incluye a todos esos componentes que hacen parte del trabajo principal del IAI, que es la ciencia, la capacitación, la interfaz entre ciencia y procesos de toma de decisiones y la diplomacia científica entre los 19 países y gobierno del continente americano. Entonces, esperamos también tener más y mayores oportunidades de presentar a todos los fellows de la primera y segunda generación sus trabajos en diplomacia científica, sus trabajos en ciencia, la interfaz entre ciencia y políticas. Y con esto termino, le, le paso la palabra a Kim, porque creo que lo más importante es que ustedes conozcan a los fellows y puedan entonces tener la interacción con ellos. Muchísimas gracias por su participación en este foro. Thank you, Marcela. I'm going to switch back to English. Um, I just want to add a few a few perspectives um, from the you know from we have the institutional perspective, but also from the fellow perspective. And it's such a joy for me to be able to work on this program and get to know all of the fellows because we're really trying to build institutional capacity, but also individual capacity. And the profile of a step fellow is unique. They are researchers that want to have an impact on policy, and I would say society. And this is not a program for researchers who want to spend all of their time in the lab or in the field. There is nothing wrong with that kind of research. In fact, we need those kinds of researchers, of course, but a step fellow wants a different journey and wants to take a different step. Um, and the inherent nature of a fellowship program allows you to have a brief, but prolonged mm -hmm. step into mm -hmm. a, a public or a private institution coupled with the step professional development program which we are building together which is a framework of key competencies for early career researchers on science diplomacy science communication and transdisciplinary leadership to become agents of change which is a topic that we talk about a lot which is being part of an inter-american knowledge community of purpose and practice. So during this pilot phase of STEP that you have all been a part of, and we're so happy that you have been, we are building a, pro a professional development curriculum together. And I would say one of the biggest questions that I always have at heart is what, what are the mindsets that we need to be cultivating to address the complex problems that are so urgently pulling at us right now? And when we think of learning capacities as a composite of different values and beliefs together with conceptual skills that will help you early career researchers excel and advance in your own disciplines, support your own creative work and then collaborate meaningfully across boundaries. Um, and step, we're really trying to look at, at identifying those learning competencies as as uh, some people put as a transdisciplinary individual, right? We want people who are characterized by an openness to other points of view, a willingness to take risks and cross boundaries, as well as a willingness to learn and to fail forward and conduct creative research. So all of our fellows this year have gone outside of their comfort zone and we thank them for it very much. And they're about to show us some of the fruits of their labor today. Um, we are so excited to grow this program, as Marcella says, to more than double its size this year. And we welcome all of the new fellows that are able to join us today. Um, and we look forward to meeting you all. Um, we will have an orientation and meet and greet event on the 22nd of October. I will send more information about that, but look forward and save the date for all of us to get together 
um, learn more about what the IAI does and then hear from each other about what we do, what brings us to the table and why we're interested in being fellows. So this is the part where I'm gonna ask Anna Watson to share some of the word cloud of the first Slido that we did while I introduce Marga, our next speaker. There it is. Okay, so this is what science diplomacy means to all of you. Collaboration, front and center, excellent. I see a reference to the word bridge often, bridging science and people, being a bridge, trust, truth, building consensus. It is fun, it is fun when you work with someone like, like Marga, for sure. Um, international cooperation and science for society. These are all excellent insights into what science diplomacy means. And Marga, maybe you can have this present as you move forward with your presentation. Thank you, Anna, for sh sharing the screen. Okay. Now I'm going to ask Hi, Marga everyone. to step can you forward. Hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Let me just introduce you really quickly. So Dr. Marga Gualsoler, for those of you who do not know her, is the founder and director of SciDip Global. She is a trainer and champion of the IAI STEP program and has 10 years of capacity building experience in science diplomacy across the globe, including partnerships with the AAAS Center for Science Diplomacy, the World Academy of Sciences, UNESCO, the International Network for Government Science Advice, INCSA, the European Union, and several governments and universities in North America, Latin America, and Europe. Marga is going to share with us today her insight on the STEP Science Diplomacy Training Program. Thank you so much, Marga. Great to see you. Hi, everyone. Hi, thanks, Kim. Can you hear me okay? I'm just checking my connection. Great. Well, it's wonderful to, to be here. It's a little bit bittersweet. So this is the culmination of a year of amazing, I think, an amazing journey we've had together. So first of all, I want to congratulate the first cohort of the STEP uh, fellows, the IAI STEP fellows, for, for really being pioneers and, 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 and working with us along the way. Um, I also want to welcome the, the second generation. We are so excited to meet you and to onboard you very, very soon. And hopefully will you, will, what you'll hear today uh, will be an appetizer for what's uh, to come for you and we'll get you all excited, as, as excited as we are. Um, and I also want to say hi, I see a few of our partners and friends and, and, and people who are in the community that wanted to check out this session today. So I, um, I'm really glad to see you all here. So just very, very briefly, I wanted to just share with you what it is that we've done in this science diplomacy track, science diplomacy training program of the, of the STEP fellowship. But before I want to step back, because it is, uh, I just want us to recognize how significant and how important this program has been, and it is, and it will continue to be, because this is one of the first, uh, maybe the first even, um, science policy fellowship program in the global south, right? So we um, are modeled, the STEP uh, program is modeled after the AAAS um, very long running science and technology policy fellowship program. But uh, as we all know, these types of fellowship programs that place scientists in government structures, in, in policymaking spaces are really uh, concentrated in the global north. And this has been uh, a passion of mine and an, an interest of mine for the last 10 years to really bring those programs to the global south. But it is not uh, easy. You cannot just replicate a model from another country because of course the, the scientific, the political, the societal uh, circumstances and contexts from each country are very, very different, right? So this work that we've done with the AI has been really to, to contextualize and to try to adapt these very successful models that are 
operating in, in, uh, in the US, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, in other countries, and not just adapt, but to bring the fellows from those programs, uh, and, and particularly with the fellows from AAAS and MITACs in, in Canada, uh, and, and, and mix them with the Latin American fellows that are really the, the, the pioneers in, in, in starting these programs for the first time. So we can really create this inter-American network of science policy fellows. Um, so this, uh, as I say, this is the first, uh, the, the pilot program. And what we've done uh, is to, to uh, overlay a professional development program, because as you all know, if you throw a scientist in a government office without orientation or training, it is not going to be easy to survive, right? So uh, we have overlaid this uh, program that month after month, uh, we have provided with the knowledge, the tools, the skills, and the networks for them to succeed in their own institutional uh, placements, but also as a network of inter-American fellows. And so the, the goals of the, of the science policy training program are really uh, just very obvious, right? First, to, to introduce and, and familiarize the step fellows with science diplomacy as a field, as a, you know, the concept, the history, the frameworks, uh, just for them to understand where we come from when we talk about science diplomacy and its multiple dimensions and facets, as we've seen in the world cloud. There are different interpretations and, and different understandings of science diplomacy, and it's very important to contextualize it uh, to the Latin American context. And for that, we have brought some leading experts, uh, panels, discussions uh, from the different Latin American countries that are working on science diplomacy, that are pioneering the different strategies and, and training programs and policies. Uh, and we have brought them to the fellows so they can have this first, in, the first person account uh, to, to you know, what it's like to, to build the science diplomacy national strategy, for instance, or a science diplomacy program at a university or a fellowship program at, um, at a government um, agency or, or ministry. And so uh, after they've become familiar with these examples and case studies and key institutions and mechanism, uh, then we uh, uh, give them also some skills because of course exposing them is not enough. So we, we give them some skills that uh, scientists not, don't usually get when they are in uh, grad school, when they're in the lab, right? In, a, in the academic uh, scientific world. And those include ne communication, negotiation, policy understanding, cross-cultural awareness, so the so-called soft skills that are not really soft. Actually, they, they are more important often than the, than the so-called hard skills. Uh, we, we, uh, we also train them in, in specific tools like conducting a SWOT analysis or uh, conducting stake, stakeholder assessments. As you know, science diplomacy is a multi-stakeholder endeavor and, and you really need to identify very well who are your um, uh, audiences and, and target institutions that you want to uh, work with. So some of these tools that are usually, uh, uh, you know, uh, in the realm of the policy uh, degrees are also brought to them so they can uh, use them and put them into practice. And the last part is actually the implementation. So we uh, we don't just want to uh, you know, train them in something abstract. We want them to use those tools and the knowledge to identify a challenge or a problem or an issue that has two conditions. One is, is transnational in the Americans, in the Americas, so it, it is uh, an issue that transcends borders and has uh, some scientific uh, underpinning, but also requires multi-stakeholder collaboration to address it. So we group them in teams of different countries. So each country had at least one member from the four countries, uh, Canada, the US, Argentina and Mexico, and all of them came from different backgrounds and disciplines. And it is that mix of perspectives, of uh, cultural backgrounds, of nationalities, of disciplines that really brought the magic. And so what you're about to witness today is the result of this process that they've gone through to, to really get out of their expertise out of their comfort zone and to really act as a as science advisors or, or, or uh, boundary spanning uh, professionals that need to understand very quickly <laughs> different types of information on different topics that are, might not be at the core expertise and be comfortable with that and be able to communicate that to different audiences and stakeholders. And so that's what you're gonna see today. Um, and just for the last, comment the last point uh, when they finish this training they receive a train the trainers toolkit so they can go back to the institutions their countries uh, and their environments and replicate this training to to amplify the effect the, the impact and as Kim has said uh, to to become agents of change so um, yeah without further delay let's uh, hear from them so thank you very much and uh, look forward to the presentations 
Thank you, Marga. Before we jump into the presentations, I did want to give everyone in the audience a chance to ask any questions to Marga or to us about science diplomacy in general, her experience in, in the training, um, about the program itself. Um, you can use the chat or you can just unmute yourself, raise your hand. Does anyone have any questions at this point? And while we're doing that, Anna, I know you just said you were gonna be, we, we do have another question we can launch to the group if there's no other comments, but please don't be shy. So if there isn't any questions directly from the audience, we're going to pose you another question then. Um, and here's the QR code if you didn't get a chance to scan it the first time. Um, we will have this up for the duration of the forum. And we would like you to think about all of these aspects that um, Marga just brought up about building bridges between institutions and seeing those bridges be the people, the fellows themselves and giving them the capacity to make those connections. Um, and really think about why it is important to have a new generation of science advisors in the region. Um, and so as our fellows are presenting, uh, feel free to keep adding your ideas here and we'll, we'll share this at the end of the forum today. Um, and I did want to take another mm, moment to thank our members from AAAS Fellowship Program who are present today. They are sister program um, and greatly took us in at the beginning when we had this idea to launch in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, a lot of our program is based off of AAAS um, SDPF program, and we've been grateful for their uh, help along the way. Um, however, this this particular component of professional development is distinct. We are the only ones that are working with science diplomacy, which is why we are so open to accepting our partners from AAAS and MyTax to have this conversation on science diplomacy. So we're gonna stop sharing the screen now, and I'm going to invite the first group of fellows, which is, the group that will be talking about the equator to pole, incorporating best practices from the Latin American and Caribbean ecotourism industries for the vulnerable polar regions. So group one, the stage is yours. Welcome. Hi, this is Julianne. Can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, let me just put it in event mode. So um, welcome to our presentation. Uh, we're very pleased to have you here um, to present uh, Equator to Pole, incorporating best practices from Latin America and Caribbean um, ecotourism industries to the vulnerable polar regions. Um, hold on here, I just want to change. Uh, I have not actually used this before. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oops. I think I'm ahead one slide too many. So to introduce ourselves, we're a group of five, um, come from a, a diverse range of disciplines, backgrounds, and geographic locations. So Anna Watson um, is based at the University of Calgary, um, also at the IAI um, in the Department of Geography at Calgary, and her degree is in environmental governance and policy. Um, or like that's her area of expertise. Um, Julian Campisi uh, is uh, at Defense Research and Development Canada, um, as am I, um, and he is a political scientist. Um, I'm also at DRDC as it's known, and my background is in sociocultural anthropology. Sophia, um, she is at uh, the Instituto de Ecologia Regional, um, and her background is in conservation biology and land science. And Megan, our fifth member, is at the US NSF, um, background is in cell biology and environmental change. So as you can see, we have a diverse range of expertise from the molecular scales to the global, from the social sciences to the natural sciences. Um, and as a group, we bring a rich set of collective experiences and knowledge to the issue of um, polar cruise tourism. 
Uh, so let's set the stage a little. Um, uh, sea ice is melting, as most of us know, in the Arctic, uh, making the waters more navigable and leading to increased shipping, including cruise tourism. Um, and it's also length, the warming temperatures are also lengthening the summer um, and making cruises much more viable. Um, the global cruise industry, as you can see, is, is huge. And in 2019, it, it was worth $154 billion. Um, and between 1957 and 1992, um, there were only 39,000 tourists who visited, let's say, Antarctica um, over a period of 35 years. But in 2019 alone, that number has ballooned to 56,000 um, visitors in a single season. So as you can see, there's a lot of people coming um, up to the Arctic, um, twice the number of uh, cruise ships in the polar regions from 2011 to 2017. Um, so cruise tourism is, is quite large in the polar regions. Um, people are attracted to the polar landscapes um, because they can go there for adventures. It's, it's a pristine nature, um, as it says in this quote. I mean, that's debatable. There's obviously been a lot of people who've lived in the Arctic regions for quite a long time. So it's not really untouched nature, um, but that's part of, it's a legacy of, of polar exploration and, and conquest in some ways that have shaped people's um, understanding of the regions. So tourism has some good aspects. Um, it brings uh, jobs, it has revenue for, and allows for diversification of the economies in the north. Um, uh, it also is an opportunity for local people to showcase their um, culture and teach people about uh, their communities but there's also some negatives to it. So it's, it's a climate intensive industry. Um, there have been accidents. Um, thankfully, no one died. Um, it's a, a, a region with not a lot of infrastructure to support tourism. Um, and of course, there's a lot of environmental um, negative impact like greenhouse gas emissions, wastes, you know, cruise ships are gonna produce a lot of waste. And if there's not a lot of governance in the region, um, <clears throat> it's not articulated, uh, it's kind of patchwork. Um, uh, not coherent, and uh, so there's a lot of gaps in policy. So this was an opportunity for us to, to, to think about how um, uh, tourism can be managed in a, a sound way that's both environmentally mindful, but also takes advantage of some of the economic opportunities, because I think on balance, research has shown that the people in the community are interested in this. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Sophia, um, who will guide us through the next parts of our uh, project. Sophia, you're on mute. Perdón. Gracias, Julian. Ahora vamos a pasar al español. Les voy a contar un poco cómo aplicamos la metodología, porque teníamos el objetivo principal de elaborar un policy brief para comentar qué buenas prácticas de América Latina y el Caribe podían aplicarse a la región de los polos en lo referente al turismo de cruceros específicamente. Entonces, como pueden ver acá, en la base de la pirámide, lo primero que hicimos fue tratar de identificar qué regulaciones y estrategias podían influir positivamente sobre el turismo de cruceros, tales como tecnología o evaluación de los impactos ambientales y ese tipo de medidas. A partir de ahí, identificamos algunos ejemplos exitosos de América Latina y el Caribe, tanto en lo referido al turismo de cruceros, como a iniciativas de cooperación científica en relación al turismo, como pueden ser algunos ejemplos de Costa Rica. Y a partir de ahí, tratamos de identificar la audiencia objetivo, que, este, revisando un poco todas las fuentes disponibles, consideramos que la Organización Mundial del Turismo era una audiencia objetivo adecuada para nuestro Policy Brief, debido a que podía tener la influencia de las estrategias que recomendemos, que identifiquemos para el, para el turismo de cruceros en las regiones de los polos. Eh, Julián, you can go to the next one. Eh, y a partir de allí empezamos a trabajar en nuestro policy brief Primero pensando cuál podía ser la revista o el journal adecuado, identificamos el Journal of Science, Policy and Governance como una buena revista, y como ya les comenté, la audiencia que identificamos es la Organización Mundial del Turismo. Y a partir de ahí definimos el objetivo de nuestra Policy Brief, eh, que es este, tratar de identificar áreas donde la diplomacia científica pueda utilizarse 
para la toma de decisiones acerca del de turismo de cruceros en las regiones polares, eh, teniendo en cuenta las experiencias exitosas de América Latina y el Caribe, y lo, lo cual también va a permitir fortalecer las colaboraciones entre estos países, y por otro lado, en este Policy Brief también buscamos derivar recomendaciones de cómo la cooperación científica puede aplicarse para guiar esas, esas, esas estrategias eh, y buenas prácticas que identifiquemos. Por ejemplo, algunas recomendaciones podrían ser eh, cómo monitorear estos sitios, cómo monitorear, digamos, si las buenas prácticas tienen efectos positivos sobre el turismo, eh, sobre el turismo, sobre la sustentabilidad del turismo de cruceros en el largo plazo y ese tipo de iniciativas. Y a continuación va a seguir Ana contándoles un poco más acerca del de Policy Brief. Gracias, Sofía. Eh, los resultados que obtuvimos con el Policy Memo eh, planteamos la brecha a partir de la necesidad ambiental y social de las comunidades y de la eh, cooperación multilateral que debe de existir para desarrollar un turismo sostenible en las regiones polares, tanto Ártico como Antártico. La brecha es muy importante hoy en día porque, como todos sabemos, COVID ha afectado mucho a la industria del turismo y particularmente en el tema del turismo del Ártico y el Antártico ha sido considerado como un lujo en una vida y con el COVID eh, hay mucha expectativa de que la demanda se incremente. Y al mismo tiempo, la COP y los reportes que hemos tenido este año de la del IPES y de, eh, de la plataforma del IPCC, nos hace un llamado a entender esta crisis entrelazada entre la parte económica, pero también entre la parte ambiental. Y en el tema ambiental, el, el tema polar es que es una industria, la industria turística depende de la conservación de estos ambientes, de prácticas que se puedan regular para su conservación a largo plazo, pero también produce impactos. Entonces, cómo balancear los riesgos y las oportunidades de esta industria para los países que tienen cierta soberanía sobre estas regiones. Y de la misma manera, cómo balancearlo para incorporar las comunidades locales que se ven afectadas, pero que también podrían ser incorporadas dentro de las buenas prácticas del turismo sostenible o del ecoturismo, para que sea un turismo realmente eh, colaborativo con las comunidades que son adyacentes a estas áreas. Del lado internacional o de la escala global, la, el, los, los cruceros afectan también los puertos y las zonas o ciudades cercanas antes a las zonas polares. Por lo tanto, es importante una coordinación entre los países. Algo que probablemente no se está dando uh, todavía porque hay mucha fragmentación y se vio durante el COVID el año pasado. Es por eso que nace el problema de cómo definir estas prácticas a partir de la diplomacia científica, que además de solidaridad es prevenir duplicación y aumentar sinergias. Siguiente, por favor, Julián. Julián, please, next. Thank you. Lo que hemos considerado es cómo crear estos, estas oportunidades a partir de experiencias exitosas pasadas. Revisamos muchos casos de la industria turística y de la industria de los cruceros, tanto en el Caribe como en Centroamérica. Verificamos que, por ejemplo, el caso de Costa Rica es muy importante porque en los años 80 y 90 el movimiento científico, así como la industria y, el, y las organizaciones políticas, lograron tener lecciones aprendidas y poder presentar sus casos para una economía basada en turismo de una manera inclusiva y sostenible. Pensamos que, aunque las prácticas no son recetas y no se pueden duplicar para estos tipos de ecosistemas vulnerables como las de las regiones polares, sí es importante tomar las lecciones aprendidas de la articulación y el, el, el engagement de los diferentes stakeholders que, a pesar de las diferencias en sus intereses, lograron encontrar espacios de comunicación y de colaboración transdisciplinaria y multinacional para poder presentar eh, buenas prácticas a la industria. Siguiente, por favor. Julian, next, please. Thank you. En ese sentido, y considerando la fragmentación y el espacio y la emergencia de este problema como una oportunidad de reconstruir mejor 
ahora con la pausa que hubo del COVID. Consideramos importante desde la diplomacia científica y como las siguientes generaciones preocupadas por la conservación de estos espacios que tienen una implicancia global, que se pueda establecer un observatorio regional encajado o tailored para las regiones polares y sobre todo la industria del turismo lujoso que se está desarrollando en estas áreas, que presenta además las condiciones de potenciales oportunidades para financiar los esfuerzos de conservación y los esfuerzos científicos que son necesarios en su delimitación y su uh, sostenibilidad en futuro. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you, team one. Okay, is there are there any questions for this first group? We have a timid audience today. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Carlos. Uh, well, uh, thanks the group for the presentation. I think it's extremely interesting project, uh, but I've noticed that uh, when you considered the possible impacts and you considered the impacts in communities and uh, on the uh, social side, uh, I couldn't see listed there the impact of the habitats being destroyed. Uh, it will reduce fauna, and therefore perhaps the attractiveness of uh, visiting the polar regions. Thank you, Carlos. Maybe I can address that question. So our idea of doing an environmental assessment of the industry in that area is to try also to move from these distinctions between the environment and the social aspects and try to think about the la capacidad de carga, the, the numbers of people that, there are, that should be allowed and the frequency of those cruisers based not just on the impact on the penguin communities or the bird protected uh, wildlife that are there, but also on how much those communities can receive to avoid really deep transformations that could not be uh, a bad words uh, um, for them. Like how we really put this industry now in new frameworks of reconciliations with the traditional knowledge, with the traditional practices, with the social organizations, but at the same time, with the science advisors based on the recommendations for the burdenness areas or for the or for the load. So although we presented in these different boxes, our main approach is to try to come up together with these kind of recommendations that are now the new trends in ecotourism and sustainable tourism. Uh, we want to be sure that those are included when we assess the risk, but also when we assess the opportunities. And of course, from the, from the economic point of view, like the finances, but to make it economic profitable also. Thank you. That's great. So I would like to encourage just one question from the audience between groups, but because it's Kevin, I'm going to give him a chance to make a question <laughs> and keep it quick. Well, Go ahead, Kevin. Well, thank you very much. And really great way to start this off. It's a, it's a very fascinating project. In fact, I was never aware there was a UN, um, inst what is it, a UN thing for tour international tourism. That's, a, that's an interesting thing in its own right. Um, I very much like the idea of turning, the, turning this around, particularly from a scientific and ecotourism point of view. And we spend a lot of, we are, obviously in Canada, you know, the Arctic plays a huge role in our future. One of the things that we talk about is, you know, Inuit led. And I'm wondering if there are possibilities for Inuit led ecotourism, where the communities themselves have control and have the decision making on how tourism hacks, how they frame it, and how they take advantage of it. Thank you. Anna, did you want to say something? Yeah, sure. Kevin, I'm glad that you point that question because I think Canada has a specific great example about that because here in Canada, there is an association of indigenous led tourism industry. So those tourism industries, lodge, cruisers, and logistics are owner and led by indigenous communities. So that is shifting the paradigm of 
being just stakeholders of the industry to being the shareholders of the industry and even be the leadership of that industries in their own terms. And that is really interesting because this is not having a long supply chain and being just the providers, but giving the meaningful opportunities for these communities to express their authenticity of conserving those lands in their own terms and defining what areas should be explored or included on the destinations of those processes. So I think that kind of experience can actually be shared with, for example, Antarctic areas or with other local coastal communities that can be affected in the Antarctic zones thinking that the Antarctic cruiser industry might be also a new boom in development in the next years. So uh, I wonder if we can also use these platforms of building a science diplomacy for indigenous communities so they can work across their own cultural views and translate their in great indigenous uh, knowledge here in Canada or in North America with their experiences with other networks of indigenous communities in the global south for thinking uh, about conservation those spaces and also be leaders in the industry so also moving the paradigm of being the victims but to be more active and proactive in the way they decide to engage with this kind of um, economic development. Thank you so much Anna. Um perfectly put, and I will add that Anna's PhD dissertation is in a very similar topic. So if you have any additional questions or want to deepen on this, please do go to the chat. We encourage you to continue the dialogue down there. I am going to share the screen really quickly and present our certificates for this first group that just presented as they officially culminate their work in the program, I would like to thank Julianne, Megan, Sophia, Julianne Campisi, and Anna Watson. Where's my little thing here? Just let's see if it works. Thank you for your contribution <laughs> and your hard work today. Um, we really appreciate your presentation and we look forward to having more dialogue in the year to come. So with that, stop sharing and introduce the next group, which is the Circular Economy Approaches to Wastewater Treatment. It's Aline, Zach, Sebas, and Christine, who will be, con there we go, Sebastian. Excellent, the floor is yours. Well, good afternoon to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to be quickly, briefly talking about the circular economy and approaches to wastewater treatment. This uh, interdisciplinary group is, joined, is formed by professionals of um, Dr. Aline Villarreal, Dr. Cristiana Fernandez Vaca, and Dr. Zach Valdez, and myself. We were looking on solutions to regional and yes, continental problems leading, leading with uh, the use of natural resources, in particularly focusing with the connections of another sectors and multi-sectoral aspects. So we found out that we should be focusing more clearly in aspects of the, on the nexus as it becomes an interesting and holistically approach to become a, like an umbrella of different systems, in particular food, water, and energy, and all the interesting interlinkages between these sectors. And as you can see clearly, water is part of the most connected sector within these, these areas. And we figure it will be interesting to assess how current and future infrastructure can lead up to changes in thinking about an optimal and sustainable use and reuse of natural resources. So we started by water and we realized that wastewater treatment information is actually an, a global issue and information is lagging in many aspects, in particular, that is not a regional aspect only, but it's a global information lagging that, of course, change with the sustainable development goals as wastewater is one of the 
one of the aspects of SDG6. But if you look at the region of Latin America, this is pretty much all red, with the exceptions of Mexico, Chile, and um, Venezuela. So we start gathering information, and at the moment, we're currently ongoing data collection on treatment plans in the region. And we wanted to know further what is the linkages or what are the aspects of the infrastructure, what is leading the resource inefficiency use, and why is this vital resource not being used? How are we gonna assess this nexus or this uh, clean energy aspects? Well, we also acknowledge that in the region, just only two thirds of the population is connected to sewage and just a little bit more of that percentage is in urban areas. Just a really small amount of wastewater is treated. And we have some exceptions with Chile, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay, where percentage goes be above 40%, but the rest of the continent goes below 20%. And acknowledging these uh, difficulties, we said, what is the methodology that we're gonna assess? And we acknowledge the circular economy as it becomes a clear way to assess resource efficiency and acknowledge the different, different multi-uses of uh, resources at the different stages of production. Started at the technolo technological design, going through the treatment, water distribution, water use and consumption, and furthermore, collection and recycling. This will enable the refinement of the different um, ecological models or business green business models, or we can say it like green business hubs, as it will create more jobs, clear job crea uh, creation, new resources, and inclusion efforts. We order all these alternatives in three main aspects. And we consider energy, water, and biosolid nutrients as um, valid resources for, for business models. And we, as I mentioned, we collected the information on Latin America. And so far we have gathered six countries, but I'm presenting five of them on the initial information on the wastewater treatment plants and technologies where we can see that there, we can gather the technologies in five stages of production and being the primary, secondary, and tertiary. Only secondary is able for use of uh, water industrial for the agriculture. And we have the technology being used in different sectors. Um, so above all, we have the secondary use is mostly the technology has been assessed and that is um, there's just a few alternatives for tertiary use of wastewater in the region sorry my connection is a little bit bad some of the outcomes of recommendations that we have uh, gathered and shared, think about case studies of heat recovery of wastewater bio-based products, other uh, successful cases of biogas and energy generation in Latin America, so that accounts in the case of Chile and Peru for efficiency savings. And we think of these three um, business models to create a resource efficiency savings and income savings in different alternatives. We identified opportunities to collaborate, sharing technology, research, and we think uh, rethinking relationships. We do not want wastewater to be considered as a waste itself, rather a resource recovery facilities, which will assess where communities are identified available resources. And uh, current, we're currently gathering information on plus six countries. We have a request for assistance ships in other countries in the region. And we want to make um, assessment of the technologies and comparisons with the global scale. The outcome, the main outcome that we're willing for is the producing of a technological 
breaches, a white paper on technological breaches in the region. We acknowledge the difficulties of Latin American countries to invest in new infrastructure. So we rather think of refurbishing existing facilities, assessing the potential for biogas utilization, biosolids generation, and water nutrient recovery. And we seek some short-term results to basically avoid the single use of water, diminish the water scarcity effects, and in the medium term, increase the biosolids and renewable energy. For your attention, thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Are there any questions from the group? I like renaming terms to not think in wasteful ways. No questions? All right. Well, thank you, Sebastian. Excellent work. And I, I see uh, one of the, the overarching themes that our, our um, groups had was uh, focusing the scope of their projects. And that was as Marga said a lot, it's about the process, not the final product, right? And a lot of the challenges that our groups had was on honing in the scope that would be realistic and effective during their project. And I see a lot of work uh, that can still be done. And I'm happy to say that with the second year of the fellowship, a lot of these groups have opted to continue for year two and to continue working in their group because the dynamic has been so effective and so enjoyable. So we look forward to hearing more potentially from each of these groups as they continue this, this work and this passion that they've discovered. Um, so with that, I am going to share my screen again to say thank you to the next group. Oh no, yes. Can everyone see my screen? So Aline, Zach, Sebastian, Cristina, thank you so much for your hard work. We would like to applaud your efforts. I don't know if you can hear the applause. That's my daughter. <laughs> and um, I forgot to do this in the last group, but we do want to invite um, people from the group to say a quick thank you. I know um, if anyone in your group, Sebastian, um, would like to say a few words, just you know, takeaways, final thank you, um, words of advice for the new fellows that are present today. Um, and I will extend the invitation as well to, I think Megan and uh, Julian, I was remiss in asking them to say some words after their presentation too. So any words of wisdom, the free to make them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can start uh, from the last group. Um, hi, everyone. Julian um, from the Polo Group. Uh, just very quickly, first of all, of course, I'd like to thank my, uh, my colleagues working on the Polar Group. Um, it's been a real pleasure, you know, getting to know you all, your backgrounds, your research and expertise. Um, you know, the diverse sort of skill sets and approaches that each of them brought to our very ever changing and complex topic was something that I found really valuable and I really hope we can you know work together in the future and that we can meet up in person soon um, of course a huge thank you to the IAI team for all your efforts as well uh, the team building exercises and things like that um, for a pilot project you know first year program I think you all did a wonderful job so thank you for that um, to the other fellows great to get to know some of you and your project and to, to learn your experiences and I hope to see you at AAAS in February as well and to the new fellows and other observers if you want to meet and work with a bunch of smart you know policy driven and diplomatic fellows um, and participate in a new program that is organized and run by you know, just really driven and awesome female leaders at the IAI um, and learn a lot of cool new skills and communication technique, then I think this program is for you. So thanks. Wow, Julian, you're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Christina. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm in the office and I haven't used the microphone here. So I just wanted to check. I'm not going to be as eloquent as Julian. That was amazing. Good job, Julian. Um, I definitely just want to echo that. I think what I've taken away from it, uh, from the program the most is the connections that we've made. So definitely working with people, you know, across borders, this international collaboration uh, would not have happened in my own fellowship. So I, I echo the, you know, working with another, a whole group of people from different backgrounds um, was eye-opening and exciting and challenging. Um, and I've met a lot of lovely people that I hope to continue to work with uh, down the line. So, and yeah, so I think the big takeaway is, is the networking part, the building bridges um, is, is huge. And I don't think you get that, um, necessarily with our own in-country fellowships. Um, so thank you also to IEI. You guys have done an amazing job with this uh, first cohort. Um, and I look forward to continuing on for a second year. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. Awesome. All right. I feel beclamped after all those happy words. <laughs> Let's pass on to group three then. Now we continue with Hydrogen for the Americas. Vicente, Matias, Nikia, and Asif, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kim. I'm gonna try to start sharing now. You guys let me know if I'm doing this right. And if you can see everything. You're live, looking good. I'm good to go, Kim? Yep. All right. Sounds good. I'm going to start my timer too, Kim. I had some 10 minute <laughs> issues. So let's keep uh, prayers up for the 10 minutes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nakia McDonald, and I am a proud member of the first cohort of the IAI uh, STEP Fellowship. And I will be delivering um, the presentation on behalf of the Clean Energy Group. Uh, but don't fret, um, my guys will be speaking towards, towards the end, so you'll get to hear from, from each one of our members. Um, and here again, these are the members of the group. Uh, won't go into too much detail. You will hear from them later. We have Matthias Helling from Argentina, um, Asif, uh, my text fellow coming from Canada. We have Vicente, um, who is a science advisor uh, from Mexico. Uh, background in physics, and then uh, myself, uh, Nakia, material scientist by training, um, and was a AAAS fellow in the Department of Energy Solar Office. Um, and uh, the work we have here, um, what I'm actually going to show um, in a minute is ideally to create a the overarching goal of our project, um, which we don't have now, was to create a digital repository. So in our mind, the idea of compiling all of the information that we've been able to obtain as it relates to um, activities in our respective countries um, in the hydrogen space. Um, and that's not to say that it'll be a comprehensive or an expansive study. Um, there are only four of us and we're not all um, in this space full time, but the idea is to have this living place where um, networks of professionals from different disciplines, the interdisciplinary piece comes into play, can actually uh, contribute, but as well as extract and take from uh, the digital repository what's needed to actually advance uh, diplomacy um, goals for whatever uh, effort they're, they're working on. Um, so that, that's the overarching idea for, for our energy project. Um, okay, and this, this is a, a busy slide, but um, we won't get into too much detail here, but we wanted to provide context for why our group um, actually chose uh, hydrogen. And, and the idea is that there are activities and strategies in each of our partner regions um, around hydrogen and our preliminary findings or scanning of the space were to actually show that there are opportunities um, for future work um, in this space and us working together 
as a team, we aim to demonstrate and show our ability to um, collaborate, exchange ideas, but also identify the strengths and the challenges that exist in ways that we could further um, exploit the opportunities for hydrogen development and implementation in our respective regions. So quickly in the top right, we just kind of have the, the SDGs that our particular focus area addresses in SDG 7 and 13, but also the second row kind of shows the areas that we've identified for further work um, in our regions and across regions supporting those two SDGs. Um, and again, the considerations box over in the, in the bottom right just kind of shows the, the areas where further work and development is, is required. But over towards the left in the green, purple, and, and yellow boxes show the potential for growth and opportunity um, for, for the advancement of, of hydrogen um, research. Let's see if I can get us to the next page. Okay, yep. And so here, as I said before, this is the preliminary work with the idea of this work extending itself to a larger effort where we aim to contribute and create this digital repository. We were thinking in mind to have future fellows actually. So the second cohort and then the third generation of, of fellows, if this is an interest area to further evolve and develop this digital repository. But for today, we have an infographic here. This is the full infographic. Um, won't get into any details presented, but just to kind of show up top some of the updates and statuses on hydrogen activities in our region, and then the bottom of the infographic, which kind of shows um, pillars or areas of collaboration that we've identified where we can get to work um, uh, rather quickly. And this is just kind of a, of a zoom in shot if you guys wanted to type, kind of take a, a look at some of the just key stats that we've identified for each of our partner regions and how we use that to, um, to drive the work that we wanted to do um, in, this, in this space. And it's just the, the first deliverable as part of this effort that we've gone through. Um, so now what we'll do is actually uh, present um, members of my team who are responsible for sort of digging a little bit deeper into each of these pillars. And, and they will talk about um, uh, each of these collaborative areas. So economic viability, I believe is next. And then we'll have uh, Mateus speaking to that. Thank you, Nikia. Well, regarding economic viability pillar, we think that with hydrogen, there is a clear opportunity for economic growth of America in the middle term especially considering a carbon constrained world. Although we think that strong policy and fiscal support through clear laws are needed in the middle term to attract and decrease the risk of industry across the whole continent. Also predictable and long-term demand is critical before industry can invest in large scale projects. So planification across the America continent could be key to achieve this. Finally, we think that the development of carbon markets could be a keystone to develop clean hydrogen production as it would economically benefit this new clean energy by decreasing the cost associated with carbon emissions. Now Vicente will talk about our next pillar. Hi to uh, hi everybody. Uh, I will I will continue in Spanish just for to make it easy for for those in the audience to speak Spanish. Um, mucho se ha dicho sobre y mucho se dice sobre la limpieza del, del hidrógeno como combustible a la hora de ser usado, pero también debemos considerar y lo consideramos en nuestro trabajo la la limpieza del hidrógeno al ser generado, al ser producido. Para esto eh, decidimos resaltar el hecho de que eh, el proceso de, de electrólisis eh, para generar hidrógeno a partir de, de agua es altamente, altamente eficiente. Además de que el hidrógeno como combustible un, sí, sí se usa para conservar, para conservar energía que es obtenida de manera limpia, eh, permite, permite eh, pasar la limpieza hacia la generación y finalmente 
eh, queríamos dar una alternativa para aquellos casos en donde se, se siguiera produciendo hidrógeno a partir de, de, combustible, eh, fósil, de combustibles fósiles, de fuentes fósiles. Eh, hay tecnologías como las CFUS, ¿no? Carbon Capture, Carbon Utilization o, o, o Carbon Storage. Gracias. A continuación, eh, mi colega Zip will, eh, va a hablar sobre, sobre el siguiente tema. Yeah, uh, thanks, Vicente. Uh, so the third pillar around which we can use and implement science diplomacy is interconnected infrastructure. So we have identified some key opportunities and gaps around infrastructure that will be uh, very important going forward for our IA countries to explore and collaborate with. So this includes transportation of liquid and gas form of hydrogen, creating uh, cross-country pipelines and also supporting low-cost technology solutions. So uh, these are very important complements to sustain uh, low-cost and large-scale hydrogen for future uh, energy market for this region. So our region also can uh, benefit or also leverage from its uh, geographical location and can be uh, an early stage adopter for hydrogen. And we can be a pioneer in creating codes and standards for hydrogen production, uh, similar to what we have done so far for um, biofuel or fossil fuel um, uh, technology or energy solutions. And finally, um, as we are witnessing more and more digital technology adoption, such as uh, AI, uh, data-driven um, technology, the energy infrastructures will be creating more and more data going forward. So this large dependency on data can also make our security, our infrastructure, and the operation of hydrogen-based uh, uh, technology vulnerable to uh, cybersecurity, uh, cyber threats, or some kind of attack in future. So going forward, it will be uh, key to find out uh, um, how we can share our data more securely uh, in a collaborative manner so that we can reduce those risks. So with that, I'd like to uh, pass uh, the mic on to Nikia again. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Asif. And I'll get us going with the, with the last pillar here where we talk about um, international collaboration. So we really wanna look at ways to uh, build ecosystems amongst members of various uh, backgrounds in communities so we can become very clear about what the defined goal should be and how we can create roadmaps to actually guide our activities. Another way is also to identify shared goals. We don't need to have one particular country or region, I don't want to say shouldering the burden, but actually thinking this is their obligation alone to take on. So we identify partnerships and we strengthen those to actually get um, societal acceptance and people um, on board to actually advance uh, uh, developments in the hydrogen space. Um, and again, creating policies that actually create standards and regulations so that we can, you know, prioritize funding, set uh, agendas, and, and really uh, kind of serve as an example of how other nations could use uh, 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 you know, the roadmap and, and take it on. And, and that's a good segue into the point, I don't know if I've made it earlier, that our regions and the information that we found is, is not to the exclusion, exclusion of other regions. We are not just talking about hydrogen for just our four regions. This is could be applicable across multiple nations. And we, our findings show how nations and countries can actually partner together and serve as an example to actually get um, this work done. Kim, I'm almost there. Um, this is the, the next to the last slide. It's just going to show how this digital repository, how this deliverable and other deliverables along the way. My team is amazing. We all coming back. So we all going to get, get working, as Kim mentioned, on um, getting this digital repository website going. And it shows how our activities and, and outputs actually uh, bridge the gap, uh, what we want to do, who we want to involve, and how that actually um, enables us to facilitate these conversations, this outreach, this acceptance, and this education. And this is just not exhaustive, but some of the, 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 the references that we used in presentation for today. So thank you very much, Marga, Step, my entire team. We did, I didn't think, I'm like, this is too easy. Like we just work together and click. It's, it's not supposed to be this easy, but I'm so glad we all renewed and, we, and we're doing this again. And Kim, if I had anything to share with the new fellows, 
it's do not think you got to have everything figured out. That's my problem. That was my experience. And I think you have to really be present and enjoy the, um, the opportunity in the moment. Uh, we had some really good activities and I'm really looking forward to what um, year two brings. I think that, you know, remember Kim, that engagement activity where we all had to role play. I think that was a really good example of using the training that you guys gave us in, in figuring out what it looks like in real time and, and how we work together. So that was my, my most favorite part. I don't know if the team has anything to share, but I enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much, Nakia. That was an excellent presentation. I enjoyed so much hearing from your entire group and thank you for those, those kind words. Um, and I'm excited to hear that the work continues for this next year. So um, Marga, did you hear that? We have lots of work to continue to do in this important area of work. Um, I'm going to share the, the certificates with you with this excellent group, and I realized that I wasn't sharing my audio before I had, and so thumbs up if you can hear this. <laughs> Vicente, Nikia, Asif, and Matias, thank you so much, and that goes to everyone. I had, um, I had my kids record their applause this morning for all of you because this is a family effort here, so thank you. All right. Without much more delay, I'm going to kick it to the last group today, which is stakeholder engagement for sharing data at the Global Health Climate Change Nexus. The floor is yours, group four. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So this is actually a good um, transition from, from the previous presentation. Uh, my group focused in on data sharing and what we could um, think about in terms of global problems um, that can be solved through some better data sharing solutions. And uh, Nikia and her group talked about that a little bit as well, um, thinking about hydrogen solutions. So I think that's just a good example of how broad so many of the topics we focused in on are and how applicable they are across different sectors. Um, so I worked on a fabulous international interdisciplinary team, just like everybody else did, um, with Shweta Ganapati in Canada, who does uh, science funding, and Danielle Jimenez in uh, Mexico, working on mobility, and Monica Jimenez, um, also in Mexico, working on uh, science policy. Um, and so we came together, and again, kind of this focus on data sharing, um, and thinking about, okay, what is the application that we wanna be thinking about? Um, and climate change came up as a, a huge topic to focus in on, um, and then specifically zeroing in on the impacts of climate change on vector-borne diseases um, and how that's changing across the Americas and across the globe. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about our project motivation, um, how we went about doing it and what we ended up with. Uh, I kind of covered this, I guess, already. Um, we focused in on this idea of climate change, uh, the impacts on vector-borne diseases, um, and we really identified looking at the literature and through conversations, this gap of ability to do data in all sorts of areas, including health, including environment, including climate data. Um, and this was largely due to uh, gaps in data in different areas. It was due to data being aggregated on different scales, being collected in different years, uh, sharing of personally identifiable information, et cetera. So we identified a whole uh, host of um, challenges that needed to be overcome. And in thinking about, okay, how do we start figuring out how to overcome those challenges? Our solution was really to just take this science diplomacy model, start bringing people together and having those conversations about where we have existing synergies and where we can help fill some of those gaps that create problems for international uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, so we went through this process of problem identification, um, proposing this solution of bringing people together and we focused in on the idea of creating a cross-cutting workshop that brings together experts in decision-making and science um, across countries, across sectors, across disciplines, 
Um, and we went into a stakeholder analysis to try and think about who those people are that we need to bring together into the same room and then who we need to be able to um, conduct outreach to after we collect all of this information as well. And what we ended up with um, was a concept note for a workshop um, that would be bringing together these expert speakers um, as well as a list of identified um, organizations and individuals that we thought would be bringing valuable perspectives on um, issues around vector-borne diseases, changes in the future um, related to climate change, uh, people in the diplomacy space, and again, that intersection between scientists and decision makers to uh, help facilitate science diplomacy in this area. Um, so once we started working on this and came and started talking to all of our fabulous fellows across the Americas and the IAI, um, we realized that we weren't the only people thinking about this, which is great, um, and that there was opportunities to uh, collaborate with the IAI, um, who was also working on putting together a workshop um, with the Belmont Forum um, for their Climate, Environment, and Health Initiative. Um, and so we were able to work together on that um, with them on a scoping workshop that they were putting together to sort of use those lessons learned that we had come across um, and learn from, from helping out with that workshop as well. So what were we thinking as a team um, in terms of what we wanted to be able to get out of the workshop um, in that concept note and the ideas that we put together on paper? Um, we thought it was really bringing together these different ideas and different people. So the idea was to have three different panels, um, one that was focusing on um, climate and health and the data sharing needs behind that um, and what some potential diplomatic solutions and logistical solutions for that data sharing um, would be. The second panel would be thinking about the future changes um, and the burdens of vector-borne diseases. So not only what we're examining now and what we have in the past, um, but how that's gonna change and how we can prepare for it. Uh, and then the idea was to bring together all of these ideas and really focus in on a more discussion-based panel at the end um, to, to figure out how to bring together solutions. And then ending up with a white paper with a summary of the insights and findings um, that we had that we could disseminate even further than those people who were able to join and participate into the workshop. Um, so this, the hardest part is identifying who to bring to the table, I think, in a lot of ways and doing that stakeholder identification. Um, and so that was an effort that went across individuals and organizations and um, going back to, I think, the purpose of this fellowship of bringing fellows across disciplines and across countries together was able to help us do that stakeholder identification across our regions and across the different sectors and disciplines that we worked in um, and come up with a really diverse group of organizations and people that would be interested and helpful in this effort um, and think about like what outputs we can get that, that would be helpful also back to those stakeholders that we were engaging. Um, the really overall objectives that we wanted to be able to achieve by bringing these people together and starting these conversations was of course, fostering that collaboration and figuring out where the common knowledge was and being able to increase the amounts of common knowledge um, across scientists, policymakers, countries, et cetera. Um, and to be able to identify some collaboration priorities um, and opportunities moving forward um, based on those knowledge bases and what we can continue to learn from each other and how we can continue to work together and where those collaborations and how those collaborations could occur. Uh, and then generally also both through the workshop and through the dissemination afterwards, just it, generally advancing the literature and the investigation of the uh, global change across the Americas to think about these public health challenges specifically in the realm of vector-borne diseases um, in the context of climate change and the data sharing needs related to that. So as I mentioned earlier, in the end, we ended up collaborating um, with the IAI and Belmont Forum members. Uh, this was really a treat. We got to work with decision makers, scientists um, from across the world, um, including back at my, our own organization. So I'm a fellow at NOAA. There were other representatives from other areas of the agency. Um, I think Shweta also had some uh, colleagues across that we were um, 
involved in these efforts. And so this really was an, uh, an opportunity for us to move forward with the work that we had done through the STEP program, but also through our host fellowships um, and agencies as well, which was really fabulous. And this workshop brought together scientists and practitioners at the intersection of climate, environment, and health um, to think about really going back to some of those objectives that the four of us had identified at the beginning. What are the obstacles? What is the common knowledge? Um, how can we better use environmental and climate information to work towards the objectives to increasing public health outcomes um, and informing actions that, that can help reach the better outcomes that, that we want. Um, it was also focused on bringing in new uh, contributors, increasing communication across sectors and across countries, um, and really doing some community building and stakeholder engagement across sectors and countries. So we learned a lot both from our final involvement and collaboration in that workshop and also just from working together as a team and involvement in this fellowship. Um, so we had, you know, an interdisciplinary multinational team working together and there were challenges, especially at the beginning, thinking of ways to uh, bring together all of our expertise um, and being able to really focus in on uh, Monica's expertise in the vector borne disease area, um, Shweta's expertise in management and stakeholder engagement and funding opportunities, and Daniela and I's uh, expertise in data science and data sharing um, and social sciences uh, was able to help us work together and come up with a great output um, and work together on this workshop where we also learned that those data needs really are overarching and extensive and figuring out how to get some better data sharing will really help work towards those positive public health outcomes um, and that we need to figure out how to pull in the resources and work together to be able to do that across countries and sectors. Um, so I'm going to stop there. And I also want to thank my team and my fabulous mentors at NOAA, um, especially Joe Conran, who has been very supportive of this fellowship. Um, and I want to open it up to my team members as well, just for a moment to, to say a few words. Thank you, Alice. Um, I'm also part of Alice's team. I'm Shweta Ganapati. I'm a MITAX fellow from Canada. Uh, and I just wanted to say that um, joining the STEP program was one of the best things I did professionally in the last year. Uh, and I'm just so glad to be part of this team and that we got to try out our project in a, in a real world setting at that Belmont Forum scoping workshop. It was really validating to see that some of the feedback that we got from that audience was similar to some of the discussions that we were having. Uh, within our groups. It was fantastic. And um, thank you, I.I., Marga, all of you fellows for your camaraderie this year. And also a shout out to uh, my supervisor, Kevin Fitzgibbons, who has been cheering me on this last year and is here <laughs> cheering us all on today. Um, so thanks. Thank you so much, Shweta, Alice. Your team is amazing. Um, just going to give you the chance to celebrate. Um, let's see, how do I do the audio again? Oh, <laughs> um, oh, it is on. There you go. Can you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel, Alice, Shreta, Monica, for all of your hard work. And it's been great to see the real world application of this project. That's exactly what we would hope would happen during a fellowship program. So are there any questions for our fellows at this point? That was the last presentation. We are coming up at the end of our agenda today. And if there aren't, I would like to take advantage and ask Marcos, who's here with us today, um, to share any thoughts or final words um, before I give a, a special thank you to Marga and the rest of us. Uh, thank you very much, Kim. Congratulations to everyone. I apologize for being a few minutes late. I was chairing another meeting, and of course, it went over. It's one of the problems of Zoom, because if you're physically located somewhere, you can't be late. Um, I, I have repeated this uh, a number of times when I've spoken. But our region, uh, North America, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, and so on, our region, the Americas, is unique. 
and is unique in a number of different ways. Uh, we're, uh, it's the most mega diverse uh, country in biodiversity, for example, uh, the greatest water resources. We are a merging of different uh, regions or peoples or a mixture of different cultures. But I think most important of all, we are an incredibly peaceful region. And I know that may sound counterintuitive in the problems that some of our countries face, but they're internal problems compared to other regions. We have very, very few transboundary wars. If you look at rich Europe, for example, there's an ongoing war in Ukraine and they still need peacekeepers in Cyprus. Africa has a number of pressure points. Asia has actors that are each other's throats and they're a nuclear tip. And yet our region is able to work together in harmony and peace. In the context of our discussion in science and diplomacy and how to use the resources that we have, it'd be good to step back and ask, what are those very special essential elements in our region that allows us to work in peace and allows us to achieve so much? And I'm of the opinion that this is the time for us to articulate this gift that we have in the context of science and diplomacy and present it as a template to the world. This region is exceptional in work that you are doing is an exception in the context of where we live. Um, I was just, I was just also like to uh, uh, finish by saying that many of the presentations today were very close to my heart. I, I worked in the polar regions in a small inlet called Pond Inlet in Northern Baffin Island. And I'm very cognizant, cognizant of the issues that the Arctic has. Uh, wastewater is a, is a special topic to my heart because of my city, Rio de Janeiro, suffers very much from untreated pollution going into the bay. Uh, hydrogen is a possible solution for our countries. And most of my uh, career has been, uh, has been more or less focused around data sharing. So congratulations. Everything was, was very much of interest. And I think this program shows the worth of the II and the support that it has received from all of you. Thank you again. Thank you, Marcos. Actually, it worked out perfectly to have you give the final words. I really appreciate that synopsis of all of the, of the presentations today. Um, Anna, maybe we can share quickly, it ties into the, the question that Marcos just made about the importance, um, the uniqueness of our region. And we're really trying to hone in on this as well um, in this program is the, the need and the importance of having you, the new generation of science advisors working in the region. And these are the things that everyone has kind of added as we've had our discussion today. So um, new perspectives, absolutely. Fresh ideas, climate change is looming, is happening, and we are all urgently needed um, at the table. Um, I see some North-South cooperation, equitable development, countering fake news, urgent need for change. The task is grand, folks. So I think um, one of the big takeaways that I get from this program is the network because we will all really need to lean on each other as we continue to work in these complex uh, challenges and, and projects moving forward. So thank you, Anna, for sharing that slide. With that, we have reached the end of our agenda, just a few minutes over, incredibly so. Um, if there are any other final remarks from Marcella, or Lou or Marga before we close out. Uh, Kim, no, just a big applause to all of the fellows, all of the groups, really this past year, uh, it has been amazing. Uh, so on behalf of the IEI step team, I would also like to say how, how happy we've been working with all of you. Your amazing scientists, amazing science policy, um, brokers, facilitators, science diplomats now. So there's, as, as we all said, the challenges are great, but I think innovative thinking as the slide showed, 
you know, new programs that really bring the best science, that brings the policy interest, that meets the challenges of government agendas, of the curiosity of the scientific community, programs like STEP, uh, and programs of our partners like AAAS, MyTech, SICTE, CREA are really in the forefront. And we really want to make a huge contribution. Um, experts like Marga, you know, guiding us through this uh, world of science diplomacy because most, if not all of those challenges are common to many of the countries are global issues. And then not a single nation can address on its own so that's why we need programs like that that brings people together, brings scientific expertise together, and brings governments together so that we can work in a collaborative way. So it's been a pleasure and an honor for all of us to work with you, the junior generation of uh, fellows, with your host organizations and countries, and we are looking forward to working with the second generation. So thank you so much, and we look forward to continue working and welcoming all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. Before um, Marga maybe says some words, I actually, I want to share something special with you, Marga. We just put this together. We wish we could be in person to really thank you with something more um, involved, but we have a special card here that everyone participated in and shared their thoughts and pictures um, well wishes and thank yous, personal notes for you to take and um, read later. But um, I, I'm thankful that everyone was able to pitch in and give their thanks. We really are grateful for the leadership that you provided um, throughout this program. Wow, <laughs> you're gonna make me cry, Kim. Thank you so much. Wow, this is amazing. I see some videos and some dancing and photos and <laughs> trips and wow i really wish we could be together <laughs> see some <laughs> um but it has been an amazing honor and pleasure to have this year with you and of course thanks to the iai for the opportunity to to build this program to experiment to pilot to to really bring this bold vision that uh, Marcos and, and Marcela uh, have had for a long time. And we have been thinking about this program for a long time. So this is really the, you know, the materialization of a, of a dream, of a vision that, uh, that comes from way, way back. And I'm so glad that we finally made it happen. And it's just the beginning of an amazing journey for the AI and science diplomacy. Uh, and all of the member states and all the fellows and everything that comes next in year two and, and beyond. So thank you so much. I want to put a plug for the AAAS meeting because many of you are asking, when are we seeing each other? So let's try to get together at the AAAS meeting 2022 in Philadelphia in February. So that would be a great way also to bring together the two cohorts and to see each other again, which you know it's necessary. It's been way too long. So uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> we step out of the Zoom and we, we meet in person, hopefully to see me. I hope to see many, many of you. Thank you so much. This is an amazing gift. And I hope to print it out or get it in some way so I can- I'll send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll send Thanks it to you. Everyone. Thank you. Yeah, if we actually, can we, uh, everyone put their photos so we can take a quick screenshot to close out the event. Put your, your happy smiles on. And I think Lou is here, but it looks like I'm gonna do it. Lou, I can I can do it. <laughs> okay, smile. One, two, three. And I need to take another because we're so many. One, two, and three. Gosh, actually, we're three pages. Well, way to go. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Look at all these smiling faces. Great. All right, I got it. I did it, Lou. I did it without you. <laughs> you could do it. Yeah. <laughs>
All right. That concludes our forum for today. I really appreciate everyone being here. Thank you to the fellows for their hard work and their presentations. Thank you, Marga, for your leadership. Thank you to the STEP team for all of your work and collaboration. Thank you, Marcos, for being here. Um, to all of the new fellows, we look forward to seeing you. I will be in communication, but save the date. We hope to get everyone together on October the 22nd for an orientation and a little meet and greet, speed dating, just hear what everyone's up to and what we're passionate about. So that will be on the way coming soon. And with that, chao, hasta luego, hasta la próxima. Muchas gracias. Gracias a nuestros Thank you. Gracias. 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 Gracias.